The gentleman you're about to meet um, is an accomplished pilot with a distinguished career. He suddenly became headline news back in um, 2009, I think, when the plane he was co-piloting over New York City encountered a flock of geese. Not a good thing. The birds disabled both engines of the aircraft and forced his crew to make an emergency landing in the Hudson River. I think most of you know the rest of the story. All 155 people on board survived, and only a few passengers sustained injuries. That's pretty incredible. The story that you're about to hear will cover the events of that day, as well as the many ways that our speaker applied his professional training and experience to the life-threatening to me situation. Our next speaker also has some experience with miracles and some important insights to share with us today. So the good news is I'm going to stop talking, and the better news is it is my pleasure to present Mr. Jeff Skiles. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today I'm going to tell you a story. And, you know, it's a story that you know from your television sets, but it's also going to be a new story for you, a behind-the-scenes story, because this is going to be a story of teamwork, of training, and of preparation by many, many people who are involved. And we're going to do that today by putting you on the jump seat. And you're probably asking yourself, what's a jump seat? Well, between the captain and the first officer in every airline cockpit, there's a little seat that folds out from the wall. And it's a, it's a very special place, and only very special people ever get to sit there. You have to be on a, a database with the Department of Homeland Security to be allowed access to any cockpit in this country. But today I'm going to put you on that jump seat, and I'm going to do that by bringing you along with me and telling you my story. Now, as you sit there to your left, you're looking at Captain Chesley Burnett Sullenberger III. As you might imagine, he prefers to be called Sully. Uh, in fact, in the course of our trip, before that, we were up at altitude, and we have these trip sheets that say where we're going and when we have to be there, when we have to be out the airport the next morning. It has everybody's name on it. And I'm looking at this name that it take, takes up the entire space that's allowed for a name on the trip sheet. And I said... Uh, I said, Sully, that's, uh, that's quite a name you got there. And I said, it must, must put a lot of pressure on a man to produce a Chesley Burnett Sullenberger IV. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, that's exactly why I adopted two girls. <laughs> now, Sully grew up in Denton, Texas, learned to fly as a teenager, and he was fortunate enough to get an appointment to the Air Force Academy. Did his four years there, graduated, and went to fighter training just after the end of the Vietnam War. He flew uh, F-4 Phantom fighters. Uh, when his hitch was up, he left and uh, was hired by Pacific Southwest Airlines, which is one of the airlines that's uh, become the current day U.S. Airways. To your right is me, Jeff Skiles. I also learned how to fly as a teenager. Uh, flight instructor while I went through college, worked for a couple smaller airlines, and I was hired at the original U.S. Air in 1986, which later merged with a bunch of airlines to become U.S. Airways of today. The uh, Airbus is the fifth aircraft type I've flown since I've been there. I've been both a captain and a first officer, and at the time I was uh, operating a construction business on the side, so I preferred to stay as a first officer and have the best trips as opposed to being a captain, where in my seniority I would have the worst. Now, I find that people like to tell me where they were when they first uh, saw, saw the picture on the TV or heard the news. And I don't know where you were, but I'm going to tell you where I was. We started out our day in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, flew down to Charlotte, and we switched aircraft, and we're on our way to LaGuardia. But uh, LaGuardia had low clouds and, and snow, and if you know anything about the East Coast, that means air traffic control delay. So we were sitting at the end of the runway in the holding area with our engine shut down, waiting out about an hour uh, ATC delay. And I'm quizzing Sully on what there is to do on the West Coast. And uh, the reason I'm doing that is the aircraft types that I have flown haven't gone west of Kansas City probably in 20 years. So places like San Diego and Los Angeles, these are exotic layover destinations for me because I have just gotten out of training. So uh, ironically, he starts telling me about the Seattle layover. He says, you've got to get the red eye, and you go out there, and there's this place called the Lake Union Seaplane Base 
that's uh, about uh, only about a 20-minute walk from the hotel. You go down there, and they will let you jump seat on their seaplanes. They go out to, up to Vancouver, British Columbia, and, uh, you know, out to the, to the western part of Washington there, all the little islands that they fly to. And, and, and I'm thinking that this is really cool. I've got out the back of my trip sheet. He's given me the phone number, who you call to set all this up, because I have never landed an airplane on water before. I still haven't made it out there, <laughs> but, but I think I got that box checked. <laughs> now, by the time you join us in the jump seat in LaGuardia, it's, it's, it's turned clear and cold. The cold front has pushed through and moved all the clouds off to the east. And we have a full flight of passengers joining us today, 150 and back. And at the gate, you're watching us accomplish our flows. We've moved beyond checklist in the aviation world, and we use the extreme standardization of our aircraft to, uh, to uh, check, the, check things by uh, the, the concept of flows. We start at one place. In my case, place, it's way up over the top of my head in the overhead panel. And we go through very methodically through the entire overhead panel down onto the glare sheet, shield down onto the uh, panel in front of us, and we check every item that comes before us. Uh, we check every, or we uh, have every switch set properly. We load our computers as we go. And then we verify the very, the most important items between us, things like fuel load, by conducting a checklist, a command and response checklist between Sully and I. We start up our engines and taxi away from the gate. It's my job to set the controls for takeoff, to input our weights and get our speeds, uh, our proper speeds for takeoffs, and talk to the ground controller. Sully's taxi in the airplane. Now, this is the last day of a four-day trip for us. When we get back to Charlotte, we're going home. Uh, Sully lives in San Francisco. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And the uh, flight attendants live in Winston and in Asheville and Pittsburgh. And I've also just been released from training literally the week before. I've just gone through training in the Airbus, and this is my first line trip on the Airbus. Now, we can only be qualified on one airplane type at a time, because in, a, in an emergency situation, we, we don't want to make a mistake and use some training from the past. So, uh, while, and while airplanes might seem all the same to you, they have completely different systems and, and different checklists. So we're only allowed to fly one airplane type at a time. A month before, I was a 737 pilot. Now I'm an Airbus pilot. And it's not just a new airplane for me. It's also my first trip with Sully. I never met him until three days before at the beginning of this four-day trip. In fact, at the time, he'd worked there for 30 years, and I'd worked there for 24, and I don't ever recall even seeing the man before. Now, you wouldn't think that this would be a good mix for us to act as a team, but we can't depend on knowing the people that we work with. It's our training and it's our procedures that allow us to act as a team from the very first moment we sit down together. Now we're holding short of the runway. I'm flying. Normally we swap legs, and this just happens to be my leg. Sully taxis us out. We position and hold, line up with the runway center line stripes. I reach up to the foot pedals to hold the brakes, and Sully says, your aircraft. And I say, my aircraft which is our terminology for transferring control of the, of the airplane. We're clear for takeoff. I reach over, push the thrust levers up three clicks into the takeoff and go around setting, and the engines start to spool up. As we accelerate down the runway, Sully calls out our standard callouts of 80, V1, rotate. I pull back on the side stick and we leave the runway behind. Sully says positive rate, and I say gear up. At 400 feet, we roll to the northerly heading, which is our departure, and we start to accelerate. Now, what you just heard, we do the exact same way every single time. We pronounce those words and no other words, because that's part of how we communicate with each other so that we can work as a team. Now, it's actually become a, a nice day at this point. The uh, cold front has pushed the clouds and the snow off to the east, and Sully, ironically, looks up at the Hudson River up to the north, and he makes the comment, what a view of the Hudson, <laughs> which turned out to be sort of ironic because we'd be seeing it close up in about four minutes. <laughs> 
We're climbing out, we're raising our flaps and accelerating. And at 3,000 feet, I pitch the airplane over to accelerate to our final stage climb profile, and something catches my eye. And I, I, I look up, and straight ahead, slightly to the right, is a line of geese, too close to maneuver around. And I hear Sully say, birds. And, and that fast, we're on top of them. They, they sounded like hail as they hit the airplane. There were multiple thuds as their bodies impacted off the fuselage, off the wings, and at least two of them went through the, the core of each engine. I remember this feeling of shock, but before, and, and, and trying to think about what, what it was we do next, what, how we can recover from this. And then both engines immediately lost thrust. They make a high whining sound of climb power, and they just reduce to nothing. I remember the shock of it felt like having a bad cold. It felt like my head swelled to twice its size instantly, and I'm looking at the world through a fog. We have the nose up in the air, and we've just wiped all the power off the airplane. You can just feel it decelerate. You can feel it sag in the air. I'm pushing the nose forward to try to keep the airplane from stalling, and Sully decides to take over control of uh, flying the aircraft at this point, which is his prerogative as the captain. And he says, my aircraft. And I said, your aircraft. Now, I've only had four engine failures in my entire career. You'd think a thing like that would happen more often, but it really doesn't. But I did manage to double my total here in just one flight. <laughs> now, when these air in airplanes were certified, when these engines were certified, they were tested to ingest a four-pound bird at 200 knots of airspeed. But all they have to do is not catastrophically self-destruct, where they blow apart and send parts outside of the engine cavity. They don't have to continue to run after ingesting a bird like that. I have a movie here which shows you the kind of damage that can occur when you have, a, a, when you have an ingestion of a bird of that size. We've got the airplane in a glide now. We're just over 200 knots of airspeed. We're losing 1,000 feet a minute, but we're only at 3,000 feet in the air to start with. Our right engine is turning at a very low sub-idle speed. The left engine is doing better, but it's not producing any thrust. It's just idling, but it's operating a a uh, hydraulic pump and a alternator for us. Now, I always thought that these were geese just by that quick view that I got of them. But they, they sent the remains that they got out of the engines off to the Smithsonian Institute for identification. They do things like that there. And they were positively identified as Canada geese. And actually, I'm very careful to phrase that now because I used to say Canadian geese. I didn't know the difference. And I did an air safety forum where there were some Air Canada pilots, and they came up and took, you know, they took umbrage at that. They said, when you say Canadian geese, it makes it sound like we put them there. <laughs> now, back in the cabin, the flight attendants know there's something wrong. It's so quiet that they're whispering to each other on their jump seats. And the passengers know that something's gone horribly wrong. They've heard and in some cases seen the birds impacting the airplane. There's flames shooting out of the left engine where the birds knock the fuel nozzles out of the burner cans and are injecting fuel directly into the exhaust where it's igniting. But still, most of them thought that we lost that engine, but we would certainly be returning to land on the one on the right side. Up in the cockpit, I reach for my what we call a quick reference handbook, which is a... 176-page book <laughs> of emergency procedures and data that we use. But coincidentally, because, as I said, this is literally my first trip on the line, I had done this procedure just two weeks before in the simulator. We don't do every one in training, but I happen to have done this one. But still, I get the book, and I have to look for the right page in this book, and when I find it, the, the checklist is three pages long, and it's designed to be done at 30,000 feet, not at 3,000 feet in three minutes' time. But still, the cockpit voice recorder showed that I was reading it within 20 seconds of impacting the birds, which apparently is some sort of record. I later had the opportunity to go and talk to Airbus test pilots in Toulouse, France, and, and they, they commented, one of them commented to me that we have simulated this, this several times, obviously, because it was their aircraft, and and we were never able to start as fast or get as far 
in that checklist as you did on that day. And they seemed to be surprised about that. And I, I don't know, I, I said I, have a re- I had a reason to be motivated. <laughs> Sully's calling Mayday, 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 which is our terminology for declaring an emergency. Our air traffic controller turns us to a heading of 220 degrees, which is a standard heading they turn aircraft to with emergencies off of LaGuardia. But the importance for us is it lined us up with that Hudson River. And we both saw it and knew that that was something that we could use. I'm resetting computers to get our speed information back, making sure we have electrics and hydraulics, and trying to, to restart the engines. Sully's talking about going back to LaGuardia with our air traffic controller, but I, I can't see it because it's on his side of the airplane. Our only options are to go back to LaGuardia, to land straight ahead in the Hudson River, or there's an airport over in New Jersey that's called a Teterboro. Other than that, all we're looking at are skyscrapers, roads, and houses. It's, it's one of the most congested areas in, in, on Earth, and there's no place to land this airplane. Our air traffic controller has stopped all departures at LaGuardia and Teterboro, and he's clearing airspace for our distressed aircraft. And at this point, he points out the Teterboro aircraft, airport at, over, off at uh, 2 o'clock to us. That's, uh, uh, we use uh, clock, clocks like a heading. And, but it just doesn't look good to either of us. I don't, we don't think we can make it. The Hudson becomes our choice for landing. It's broad and it's flat. And if we were to strike off across land to get to an airport, we'd have to be sure that we could make it. Now, what I remember most about that descent to the river was all the, the noise in the cockpit. We have all kinds of oral alerts uh, that go off for various kind of emergencies, and, and most of them are going off simultaneously. We're getting these whoop-whoop-pull-up call-outs from our ground proximity warning system, uh, and I don't even know why we were getting that because we weren't in the situation where we should have. We're getting a traffic, traffic call outs because we flew too close to a helicopter that was coming up the Hudson River. We're getting two, continuous too low gear, too low flap audible call outs over our speakers. And our uh, alert bell is sounding continuously as these cascading failures are overwhelming our monitoring systems. Through all this noise, Sully has the presence of mind to reach back and grab the public address telephone, which looks just like an old-style telephone receiver, and it's on the back of the quadrant in between us. He picks it up and he gives the command, this is the captain, brace for impact. And this is actually a signal to our flight attendants to begin their emergency procedures. They start chanting in unison, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, brace, brace, heads down, stay down to compel our passengers into the proper position for a crash landing. Now with this, the passengers know that they're not going to be returning to land. And they they actually handled it in a number of ways. Some of them wrote notes and put them in their shirt pockets. A large number of them texted loved ones on the phones that were supposed to be shut down when they left the gate. (laughs) One pastor showed me, his, uh, showed me his text two years later. He still had the same phone, and it said, Plane's going down. I'll always love you. Say goodbye to the kids. One of the passengers I know uh, had two days of bad luck. Just the day before, his wife had been diagnosed with breast cancer. She's thankfully recovered today. But being a spiritual man, he had made a pact with God. And, of course, he... He thought, he's, he thought, God, if you have to take somebody, please take me. So here it is less than 24 hours later, and he's plummeting to the earth in this engineless aircraft. <laughs> not, not knowing what the next few seconds of his life would hold. And he told me, he said, all he could think about was, God... I know we made this pact and all, (laughs) but did it really have to be so soon? (laughs) Now up in the cockpit, we have to start slowing the airplane down. At this speed, we're going too fast, and we'll, we'll break apart when we hit the water. 
So we put out our flaps, which our flaps and our leading edge and trailing edge flaps, which allow us to lower our speed, but we leave our gear retracted. And this reduces, reduces us to our absolute minimum flying speed of 135 knots, which is about 155 miles an hour. At 1,000 feet in the air, we know we're not going to be able to restart the engines. They're, they'd never spool up in time. We're going to have to ditch the airplane. So I start calling out airspeeds and altitudes to, to Sully to give him situational awareness. Now, he needs to land with the wings perfectly level to keep from possibly digging a wingtip and cartwheeling the airplane. But one of the many, many things that went our way that day, and I, and I tell people we had one moment of bad luck and a thousand moments of good luck, uh, was that the river was calm. And at that moment, there were no boats in our way, which is really unusual in the Hudson River. As our airplane blinked off his radar screen, our air traffic controller, Patrick Harton, thought to himself that he would never talk to anyone on that airplane again. But even in, even in dire situations like this, there's moments of levity. Uh, about four months later, we were asked to go and listen to our own cockpit voice recorder tape by the National Transportation Safety Board. And we both heard something, Sully and I, that we, that we didn't remember at all from that day. Right before we, we hit the water, Sully asked me, you got any other ideas? <laughs> and I said, actually, no. Yeah. <laughs> there, I remember this odd feeling like sinking into a hole as the skyscrapers rose so, so close off our left and the bluffs of New Jersey off of our right. We hit hard on the tail. And then the river just seemed to flow over the airplane as, as water cascaded under the windshield. But then it popped up, and it was just bobbing in the waves, the way you saw in the picture. I turned to Sully, and I said, well, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> but we lost electrical power. And Sully had to get up and go back to the cabin to physically command the evacuation because our public address system didn't work. And I stayed behind to uh, run another checklist, an evacuation checklist. We even have things for emergencies like this, although the first item on it was parking brake set. <laughs> now, the flight attendants don't know that we've landed in the water until they open the doors and see the Hudson River, but they instantly change their commands to don life vests, come this way. Now, the landing wasn't that bad up front. It was pretty severe in back. The belly had ripped out of the airplane, and the tail was filling up with water. The, floor, the rear baggage hold had pushed up through the floor of the rear galley, and a structural member had come up with it and severely gashed Doreen, our B-flight attendant's leg, where she sat in her jump seat back there. Blood is spurting from her wound, but she doesn't realize it yet. The passengers rushed to the back of the airplane, where some of them reported that the water was up to their necks but she managed to get them turned around and headed back forward for the overwing exits. Now, by the time I go back, the passengers are, are rapidly exiting the airplane. About the first 10 rows are already empty. And, and we always know that, you, you know that sometimes your fellow travelers aren't always the best and the brightest. But I'm, I, I'm standing there in that little hallway between the cockpit and the cab, and I'm immediately faced with this, you know, 25-year-old guy running up the aisle towards me wearing nothing but boxer shorts and a pair of sweat socks. I mean, it's January. It's 20 degrees outside. I'm pretty sure he didn't get on the airplane that way. <laughs> I later found out it was his idea that he was going to swim to shore. So he managed to take all his clothes off back there somehow. Well, I guess we should count ourselves lucky he left the boxer shorts on. <laughs> but he wouldn't have got 10 feet in that water. The river actually started to freeze over two days later. I hope the last of the passengers off went back to about mid-cabin, and Sully and I uh, and a couple passengers were back there getting life vests and seat cushions and passing them out to the people on the wings. And, and the, the water was just freezing cold. It was about up to my knees back there, but any part of your body that was in the water just ached to the bone. 
Well, all of us started walking on the seats and on the armrests just to keep our legs out of the water, but we still had to reach down underneath those seats and that, that ice water to get those life vests. The rear slide rafts were unusable because of how the airplane was sitting in the water, so the passengers had no option but to stand on the wings in that literally freezing cold water. The wing was slippery with jet fuel, and some of them were sliding off, and they'd have to help, help each other back on. Originally, the water was only ankle high for some, but eventually the right wing dipped down in the water, and some of those people were still standing on the wing in waist-high water. The passengers were incredibly admirable through all of this. There was no pushing, there was no shoving, but this was a Thursday afternoon commuter flight. There was only one elderly person on board, and there was only one family. In fact, eight of them were so unfazed by the experience that when they eventually were rescued, taken to the ferry dock, they walked, walked through the ferry terminal, went out to the road, hailed a cab, went back out to LaGuardia, <laughs> and they were on the next flight to Charlotte. <laughs> now back where I am in the cabin, the plane is filling up with water. But I'm no more than maybe about 20 feet from the emergency exit hatches at any given time. So I thought if it suddenly sank, I could probably get out and swim for it, so I wasn't concerned for my own safety in any way. But after about, uh, uh, after, after, I don't know, some period of time, and I don't know how, I lost all track of time in this, uh, Sully came through and he said, let's get out of here. So we went up and exited through the, the normal, uh, you know, through the front door that you would normally board from. And I remember this, this odd feeling of, of trading the, the calm of the cabin for this pandemonium that was going on out on the river. The airplane was already surrounded by boats. There was a helicopter overhead, and it was dropping a frogman into the water. And the helicopter spray was, was kicking up water and freezing all of us. In our raft were Sully, Donna, and I, and the passengers, and we were wet and cold. I managed to cut the tether on the raft, and the, uh, the raft floated around the nose of the airplane, and we were all set to be picked up by this uh, nice low boat. And then a big passenger ferry came, uh, came and decided he was going to be the one to pick us up. And I remember looking at this passenger ferry, and when it came up, and and it was about eight feet up to the deck. How are we going to manage to get a scale that? And a crewman came out, and he threw this boarding net over the side. And then he threw a rope over that I could hold the raft next to the boat with in my in my elbow because I couldn't even I couldn't even grasp the rope with my hands anymore. They were so frozen. And the passengers started climbing up the boarding net onto the airplane. And I, as I said, my hands were absolutely frozen, and I couldn't even think about how I was going to climb up myself. And and after what seemed like not much time at all, I hear Sully behind me, and he says, Jeff, we better get out of here while we still can. And I looked behind me, and and the raft was empty. All the passengers had, had gone up. So we managed to climb up the boarding net. I had to put my whole arms through the the uh, areas between the ropes just to, just to climb it because I couldn't grab it with my hands. And we got up on the deck and we immediately went into the heated cabin. And once, on, once on, in the cabin, there's a passenger there and right as I'm coming through the door and he's got one of those flip phones and he's just flipped it shut because he called somebody. And he offers it to me. And I thought, oh, maybe I should call somebody. <laughs> but I thought, who should I call? And I thought, well, I'll call my wife and let her know I'm not going to be home tonight. That's a bad idea, guys. You know, what do you say to your wife at a time like this? I dial the phone with my knuckle. I manage to get the number right about the third try. I've got it up to my ear. I'm looking out the window. Planes floating by at this point. There's still passengers on the wing at this point. And she answers. And I said, uh... I don't think I'm going to be home tonight. And she says, why? 
and, and I don't know, the last 20 minutes of my life just sort of spurred it out of me. I said, well, we took off from, from LaGuardia. We hit birds. We flamed out both engines. We had to just the airplane in the Hudson River. We think we got everybody out okay. I got to go. <laughs> and I hung up. So then Sully tries calling home, but he's got caller ID, and his wife's talking to a friend of hers on the phone. So she looks at it and says, uh, oh, it's, it's just Sully. He'll call back later if it's important. So then he tries calling our dispatcher. We have dispatchers in the airline business that are co-responsible for, dis- for the, the flight, the safety of the flight. And, and he calls up, him up, and to his credit, he answers the phone. And he says, uh, I don't have time to talk to you right now. We have an airplane down in the Hudson. <laughs> now, the last 20 minutes of my life have been pretty action-packed, and with all the shock and the stress and the fact that this boat is rolling pretty good, I'm beginning to feel really sick. But fortunately, it's not long before we touch at the ferry dock. The flight took five and a half minutes, only two minutes until we hit the geese, and three minutes until we landed in the Hudson River. It took me five times that long just to tell you about it. Now, as I'm sure the people in this room understand, there's, there's a back story to this. And great events don't, don't happen without planning and preparation that long predates the actual event. There's supposed to be audio with this. There we go. Jack, it's 15.900, spark to contact, I maintain 1 5,000. Maintain 1 to 5,000, Jack, it's 1549. That's probably more geese than there actually were. <laughs> Cactus 15.9, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit first to Plum Thrust, I'm going to return back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading up uh, 220. 220. Tyler, stop your departure, he's got emergency returning. Cactus 1529, he, uh, bird strike, he lost all engine. he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. All right, Cactus 1549, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire, actually, LaGuardia departure guy, emergency inbound. Hey, guy. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. What's your hour for a check? Does he need assistance? Uh, yes, he, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway one? Runway one, that's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. Can you land runway right. one at Teterboro? We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5, 4718, turn left thing 210. 210, uh, 4718. Uh, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. Cactus 1529, uh, he's gone. Thank you. We were at the ferry dock long enough for the uh, politicians to arrive. Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Patterson came to hold a press conference on site. And this is where Governor Patterson coined the phrase, the miracle on the Hudson. But was this really a miracle? You know, Sully's probably the most professional and capable airline pilot that I have ever flown with. And his leadership skills and calmness at this critical juncture are second to no one. But the real story is about the safety systems that were developed and implemented in my industry over the last 20 years that allowed the flight and cabin crew to work as a team. The world embraced this incident. They couldn't understand how an airliner could crash and have everyone survive. 
But within the industry, this was viewed as a vindication of the journey that we've undertaken the last 20 years in human factors and safety engineering. In the 1980s, we'd identified a problem with our traditional safety systems in aviation. We'd improved accident rates resulting from mechanical failure as aircraft became more reliable, and we'd improved rates of accident rates caused by the environment as aircraft became more capable of identifying and circumnavigating hazardous weather. But what was left was a glaring segment of accidents caused by human error, pilot error, as we call it. Up until this point, a pilot was expected to be perfect. Mistakes weren't allowed. We took a check ride every six months, but it was a test, not training. There was no ongoing training and new procedures that was ever given. And there were no attempts at safety improvement. This was the state when I first started at U.S. Airways. We had a top-down management system dating from the early days of aviation, a system where rank was everything. But the industry had changed, and aircraft and systems had become more complex, and the traditional relationships between the pilots needed to change to reflect those advances in technology and human factors engineering. My own airline had suffered five fatal crashes in five years. They were hemorrhaging money in a bad economy, and morale was non-existent. U.S. Air realized that safety improvements couldn't wait. The continuation of the airline as an entity depended on it. And they instituted a relatively unheard of concept at the time called Cockpit Resource Management, or CRM. And that was the first step in the tremendous reforms that, that have transformed safety in my industry. The first step was to change the culture at airlines to reflect today's reality. We underwent training to give us the skills to communicate and to work as a team. We trained in groups with the entire team present, pilots and flight attendants off-site and in civilian clothes with none of the traditional markings of rank. It took a number of years to change our ingrained culture. Some people simply couldn't adjust and disappeared when overtaken by retirement. But eventually, we all gained the understanding that that we want the same outcome, a safe flight. And it's not a challenge to anybody's authority to point out a simple mistake. Now we pass or fail check rides as a crew instead of as individuals as we used to. If the pilot I'm flying with makes a mistake and I don't correct it, I fail too. Over the years, we eventually created this environment we enjoy today, where we complement and support each other as a team. And any error or omission is expected to be picked up and pointed out by the other. The next step in our evolution was to standardize our actions by developing what we call standard operating procedures and checklists. And these SOP, standard operating procedures, involve both pilots and all critical inputs, particularly in navigation and auto flight systems. Every step and action of our day is specified by an SOP, including how we talk to one another to avoid mistakes. Remember how I told you about that rigid communication that we have at takeoff, where we say those words and no other words so that we don't make errors and we can communicate with one another. But we take this one step further. It's understood that rarely is an accident the result of one simple mistake. Normally, accidents are caused by a chain of smaller mistakes that on any given day, at any given time, can lead to the scene of an accident. If you break that chain, the accident doesn't happen. But how do you break that chain? How do you find out about these smaller mistakes that lead to an accident? Well, in the airline world, we've created a robust data collection system consisting of self-reporting of mistakes, flight deck observation, where we are observed by other pilots. And also, the computer systems can actually downlink when we do things we're not supposed to do. All reports have complete immunity from reprimand. They're de-identified before they are evaluated, because we think it is vastly more important to identify the hazards and threats to safety than to identify and punish an individual for a mistake. So we give pilots permission to make mistakes, the human mistakes that everyone can make. We only ask that pilots admit those human mistakes and be part of a comprehensive solution. An error by one person is a mistake. 
An error by five people is an operational hazard requiring an organizational solution. So we accept that for human factors reasons, errors can happen and devise procedural solutions to trap those errors that data collection shows the group is subject to. So what have we done here? We identify the errors the group is making. We track those errors and through statistical analysis identify threats to safety. We devise procedural solutions to trap, to, to trap those errors. And we change our way of operating and train these changes into the group all before they lead to an adverse outcome. This is a proactive safety system, not a reactive safety system. We call it barrier to error management. And every year we create a new training scenario that trains new procedures or focuses and emphasizes ones that we've grown lax in. We created a resilient learning safety management system that drives everything we do. So what does this lead to? The last major fatal crash in, uh, of a major airline in this country, and major airlines are the only ones that adopt all these procedures, was over 10 years ago. Remember, my own airline alone had suffered five fatal crashes in five years prior to the implementation of these practices. The success, this success is due to the changes that we've made in the last two decades. Twenty years ago, our fate might have been different. But today, Sully and I had the tools necessary to interact with each other and with the technology of the aircraft. We had a clear understanding of what our roles were in an emergency. All I needed to hear was Sully say, my aircraft, and I knew that my role had changed and I'd been placed on a new path. I immediately reached for my quick reference handbook and starting into the procedure to try to solve our problem without orders or direction. Where normally we monitor and cross-check each other, in emergencies we split into two roles, the pilot flying and the pilot who solves the problem. While, we've no defined, while we had no defined procedure for this unusual emergency, we have an emergency protocol that we use, a sequence of actions and commands and responses, and our familiarity with it negated the need for conversation. There wasn't a lot of verbal communication between us at all. We never made eye contact, but we knew what was in each other's heads. We accomplished our individual roles, but we also worked together seamlessly. And this didn't occur from years of working together. Remember, Sully and I had only met three days before. It was our training, our procedures, and our communication systems, the tools provided to us by airline management. And even in this perilous, time-compressed situation, those systems didn't break down. On January 15, 2009, we had a lot of luck and a lot of help. It was a team effort from the start. Sully and I, the air traffic controllers, flight attendants, boat crews, all following their emergency preparedness procedures, and, and frankly, the passengers themselves. Everyone had an equal role to play in the miracle in the Hudson. For Sully and the flight attendants and I and the part we played in this event, it was certainly the application of a lifetime of training, well-developed procedures, and teamwork because those three elements provided us with a structure to analyze our situation, and they provided us with a process by which we could solve our problem. But ultimately, I think the story of Flight 1549 is a story of people, people who all had a role to play, and they played those roles flawlessly, along with the, the innumerable people who created our modern cockpit systems and procedures. It doesn't require a miracle. It doesn't require a hero. What it does require is everybody following their training, doing their job, utilizing the tools that they've been given. And as in all great things, it's the immense power of the group that far exceeds the accomplishments of any one or many individuals. That's my story of U.S. Airways Flight 1549. Thank you for allowing me to share it with you. Thank you. And I, I want you to know that a good presentation comes from a good story, a good presenter, and a great audience. <laughs> All three are major components, so, so thank you. You've held up your end.